Now we've all we've all been there before. Uh, we've all been in a place where one moment we're feeling completely at peace. We feel like everything's going to be okay. All the things we care about, it's all good. We're content, we have no real worries. And the next moment, you find out you're getting fired from your job. Or you find out that your friend or even your spouse betrayed your trust in a terrible way. Or you go to your doctor and your doctor tells you some very bad news about your health. What happens? Suddenly, the peace is gone. One moment, you're fine, you're at peace, you're content, the next moment, peace is gone. Now Jesus says that he gives us a peace that the world cannot understand. In verse 15 of our reading, the Apostle Paul tells us, let the peace of Jesus rule in your hearts. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like for the peace of Jesus to rule in our hearts? You might ask, do I have this peace that he's talking about? Uh, even if the little things in my life seem to just take away my peace. I mean, does that mean that I have the peace of God if even the smallest things seem to disturb my peace? And if I don't have this peace, how do I get it? How do I get this peace as a Christian? Now, uh, two Sundays ago, I talked about how sometimes we confuse spiritual gifts and spiritual actions with spiritual growth. And I said that so often we, we look at the, the incredible giftings or the incredible things that people do for God and we say, that is you know, real spiritual maturity. That is what a Christian is. But I told you that the Apostle Paul said you can take all of those spiritual gifts, all the greatest gifts, all the greatest spiritual actions for God, you can combine all of that together and if you subtract Godly character, love, and then you're left with zero. Remember I said that. Uh, that is the equation of the kingdom of heaven. You can take all of that, but if you subtract godly character and love, you're left with absolutely nothing. And last week, I shared that forgiveness is one of the signs of spiritual growth. And today, what I'm going to talk about is how peace is also one of the signs of true spiritual growth. So, you know, we focus so much on, on the actions and the, the experiences, but I want you to see that true spiritual growth looks like forgiveness. It looks like peace. You know, when we see a very muscular person, like let's say Arnold Schwarzenegger, or you know, one of the big bodybuilders came up uh, and he came up on the stage, when you look at someone who's like really strong, really muscular, do we automatically assume that that person is mature? No. Why? Because we know the difference between power and mature. We can make a differentiation. We know that just because that person is powerful doesn't mean they're also mature. Doesn't mean there's growth in their heart. They may have growth in their muscles, but that doesn't mean they have growth in their hearts. So we understand that great power doesn't equal maturity. So I want us to understand that the same concept applies to spirituality. That spiritual maturity, so often we equate spiritual power or spiritual gifts or spiritual actions with spiritual maturity. Uh, but I want you to see that they're very different. They, can, they could be further apart. Now, as I said, the best the best situation is when you have both spiritual power and spiritual actions and spiritual maturity. That is when you have everything, right? That is what we're going after. Uh, but right now, I just want to make that differentiation for us. Now, today we're talking about Christian peace. And I just want to give you a, a, little, a little story to, to explain a point. Let's say there are two women talking to each other. One woman, let's say her name is Jane, and let's say the other woman's name is Mary. And let's say Jane is single, and Mary is married. It makes it easy to remember. So Mary is a married one, Jane is single. 
and let's say they're talking to each other, and let's say Mary is really known for being very joyful, very positive, and always being happy. Uh, and so, you know, Mary is, is talking to Jane. Jane is not, she's not very happy right now. And uh, Mary says to Jane, Mary, Mary says to Jane, Jane, uh, I think you just need to get married. You know what, you, I know you look so unhappy. You know what, if you find that the perfect guy, you're going to be happy. And let's say Jane says this in response. Jane says, I'll never be as happy as you are, Mary. Even if I find a perfect husband, because what I really need is not your marriage. What I really need is your attitude. What I really need is your values. Now, is that how we normally respond uh, in those situations? No, not really, right? We, we would say, yeah, you're right, you know? I just need that perfect husband, or I just need that perfect job, or you know, I just need this, or I just need that, right? We're not gonna be like, no, what I really need is your values and your attitude. Uh, we, don't, we don't tend to think that way. Isn't it true that we often say, you know, I was totally fine in that piece until he did this to me, right? Or I was totally, you know, happy until I lost this. Or I was totally content until I heard this news. We tend to blame our circumstances, right? We tend to blame other people for our loss of peace. We say, that is the reason, or this person was the reason that I lost my peace. But if you look at the Word of God, that is not how the Word of God talks about peace. Uh, and in fact, this is backed up now by modern psychology. Most experts in psychology will tell you that circumstances and people are not the real reason that we don't feel peace. Now, here's where it differs from scripture. All those experts, they will tell you the real secret is positive thinking, or meditation, or other techniques to, to you know, train your mind. But the Word of God goes at the very root of the problem. The Word of God says peace is not a general sense of everything is okay. That is not peace. Peace is not something we develop through technique or through willpower or through control. The Bible says we don't have true peace because peace is actually a living power. Peace is active, it is personal, and it is powerful. It is not just a state of mind. It is not a general sense of comfort. It is a powerful force that is living and active. See, remember, verse 15 said, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. Right? It is not just a state of mind. It is a peace that is dominating your situation, your life. So most people, most people in our lives, and maybe, maybe us, right? maybe you said this, most, most people will say, uh, we don't have peace, or you don't have peace because your circumstances are not right. So you just need more money, or you just need more power, or you just need that right marriage, or you just need better looks, or you just need more stability, or you need more education, right? That is what the world, many of our friends, or even maybe we say that, experts, psycho psychology experts will say, no, that's wrong, you need to meditate more, you need to practice positive thinking, you need to control your thoughts, it is not in your circumstances. But scripture tells you something different. Scripture says, what you are missing is a person. It is not positive thinking. It is not your willpower. It is not technique. It is a person. See, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit in the Garden of Eden, they disobeyed God, and what happened? Their relationship with God was broken. And then what happened? They suddenly felt like they were missing something. So they cover themselves. They realize, I don't, I don't have clothes, I don't have coverings. So they cover themselves to try to feel at peace, to cover the anxiety. You see, they never needed to be covered before. They never knew they were missing something. They never had that deep sense of loss until they lost God. It's when they lost the relationship with God that they suddenly felt that they were missing something and they tried to cover themselves. 
may it feel at peace. You see, circumstances and people are not the real triggers of your unhappiness and your loss of peace. Circumstances and other people may be the occasion for your loss of peace. It may be the moment when you lose your peace, but it is not the cause of your loss of peace. Do you see the difference there? It's not the cause of your loss of peace. Those circumstances are just moments when you can express what was already inside you. But there was something already wrong in here. There was, oh, there was already something here that was not at peace. And when that person said something, or when you lost that, or when that didn't go right, it was not that that caused it, it was that it allowed it to be expressed, what was inside you, to come out. That is what is happening. So the question is, who or what is inside you? What's coming out? Is it Jesus or is it something else? You see, the peace of Jesus, the peace that we get from God, like I said before, it dominates us. And it changes our vision. So everything that we see becomes interpreted through that peace. So all our circumstances, all the, the people in our, life, in our lives, all the situations we get into, all of that is filtered through the peace of God. Right? It becomes our way of seeing. Now the peace that the world can give you, wealth, career, status, family, influence, power, like that is the peace that the world offers you, right? Just get this nice car and you will finally be at peace. Just get this nice home and you will finally be at peace. Just earn six figures, right? Just get that perfect salary and you will finally be at peace. That peace is constantly dominated by circumstances. So you see the difference there? The peace of Jesus is the one that dominates. It is the one in control. The peace of the world, you are never in control. It is always your situation, always people who are controlling your peace. Depending on how things change, that is how your peace will change. If you stake your peace on your wealth, and your wealth is gone, your peace is gone. But if Jesus is your peace, and you, can, you lose your wealth, then what will happen is his kingdom will dominate and interpret how you understand that loss. You will no longer see it based on the world's value, but you will see it from the perspective of eternity. And let's say you lose a lot of money, but from the perspective of eternity, you realize that's not, that's not that much. It's not a big deal. I'm living for eternity. That is a lot of money, but I'm not seeing it from the world. I'm seeing it from a different filter. The peace of the world, right, it gives you tunnel vision. All you see is that one thing that you're banking on for peace. I need that money. I need that education. I need that job. I need that status. I need that stability. Right? It is tunnel vision. That's all you see. And when you have that kind of tunnel vision, you have no room to give to other people. But the peace of Jesus gives you eternal perspective. It is infinitely wide. That is why gospel-transformed Christians are so generous. That is why they don't need all these things to give them peace. They have this incredible wealth about them, even though they don't have much. It is because they have this perspective. You see, the peace of the world can never give you true peace because it depends on how well you can control your circumstances. And some people have more control than others. Some people have more power. Some people have more money. Some people have more status. But in the end, no matter how much power you get, no matter how much influence you get, you will never be in complete control over everything, and therefore you will never have complete peace. But the peace of Jesus allows us to surrender control. It is not, see, you see there's a very big difference here. In the peace of the world, you need to grab more control. In the kingdom, the peace of Jesus, we surrender control. And you rest in God's supreme authority and control. It is a completely different way of living. 
And sometimes when I'm driving and I'm feeling tired, uh, my wife will say to me, uh, honey, let me take over for you. You know what? You look, you look really tired. I know you've been driving for a long time. I'll drive and you can rest. And suddenly I'm no longer tired. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm tired. No, no, I'm suddenly I'm, I'm wide awake. I'm wide awake. I can think about it another two hours. Don't worry about it. You see, my wife, and this is like a running joke actually, my wife, she hasn't driven for years. So uh, this is a running joke of ours. But when I'm tired, she'll tease me and she'll be like, honey, you want me to drive? You're going to be tired. And she knows, she knows I'm never going to let her drive. So I'm suddenly alert, you know, and suddenly fully, uh, you know, fully able to drive as long as I need to. She knows, uh, she knows that if she drove, I would not be resting. Right? She says it's for my rest, but she knows I'd be more stressed if she drove, more tired. Now, why is it that in some cars we can sleep, and in other cars we're alert, we're suspicious, right? we're checking everything, right? Did you put in gas? Did you, did you put on your seatbelt? Did you make sure you close the door? You know, are you sure you're supposed to turn there? Aren't you driving a little fast? Aren't you driving a little slow? Right? You know, we're always like checking and we're, we're, not, we're not able to relax, right? Our capacity to, to sleep and relax in a car is based on who the driver is, right? It, you know, we ask, is the driver skilled? Is the driver dependable? Is the driver wise? And we ask all those questions. And when it's yes, 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 then we go to sleep. We relax. We don't ask questions. We're not suspicious. We're not alert. We're not trying to figure out how this car works. What happened if we get in an accident? We relax. We can sleep. If, as Christians, we find that we're constantly questioning, constantly afraid, anxious, Suspicious, doubtful. What does that say about our view of God? Aren't we questioning Him, His character in some way? Aren't we questioning His skill in some way? Aren't we questioning His power? I mean, that's the only conclusion you can come to. The reason that you cannot relax is because you feel that there is good reason to doubt or to be suspicious or to check on God. Is does He know what He's doing? You know, at this very moment, God's grace is holding all the atoms in our universe together. If God just decides, I'm not going to hold the atoms together, everything in our universe will fall apart. Time, you know, we take time for granted. Time is moving, right? We're, we're moving in time. If God decided, I don't care about time anymore, there's no more time, right? we wouldn't be progressing in anything. We'd be stuck in limbo. It's only by God's grace that our universe is here right now. He is sustaining at this very moment. If God decided, you know what? This universe is so, so stressful. I don't, I don't want to deal with it. It's gone. Our universe is gone. He is orchestrating every single life on this planet. Billions of people, He is orchestrating and, and strategizing and leading billions and billions of people, matching on all their different circumstances, making sure that everything works out for His grand plan. He's doing this all the time. He's fighting a spiritual war. And he cares about what you are doing right now. And he is intimately involved in what you're thinking right now, what you're going to do a couple minutes later. He's dreaming about your dreams. He wants the best for you. And he does all of this with infinite room to spare. And he is orchestrating, controlling, managing all of these things with infinite room to spare. I mean, there, this is nothing for him, right? He, he has infinite power. He has infinite wisdom. Do you live like this is your God? Do you live like this is the God who is in control of your life? Or are you a backseat driver who is complaining and giving advice to the driver and questioning, you know, God, I don't know. I don't know if you're supposed to turn there. You know, I think you're driving a little fast, God. You know, I know you take care of the universe, but I don't know, my life is really complicated. You know, I have a lot of things going on in my life. I know you, I know you got all the star systems mapped out, but you know, my life is really confusing. I don't know if you have my happiness in mind. And we ask all these questions, right? And I do too. But we have to ask ourselves, maybe there's something wrong 
with the way we see God. Maybe we are not seeing who he truly is. Maybe we need to stop and reflect on what he's really capable of. Now we can be clear about what we mean by peace. If my parents pass away, I will be sad. I will grieve. If someone hurts my wife, I will get angry. When Jesus lost his cousin John the Baptist, he grieved and he wept. When Jesus saw people abusing the house of the Lord, he got angry. Jesus got lonely when his friends left him. Aren't these examples of not having peace? And I don't know how you think about Christian peace, but if Jesus is getting upset and sad and broken and angry, aren't these examples of, well, Jesus isn't very peaceful. Right? He's being, he's being you know, too influenced by what's going on around him. But clearly this is not what Scripture is saying about the peace of Christ. Because Scripture says Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Now let me ask this question to help us to understand peace based on what the Bible is saying. Uh, what thing in your life, if you didn't have it, would make you want to end your life? I know it's a very gruesome, not a very nice question, but to really, really focus our attention. What, what thing in your life, if you lost it, would make you want to not live anymore? Now, for most of us, and I'm probably, I'm probably guessing that almost all of you have one thing in mind. Uh, maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your reputation. I don't know, I don't know what it is, but we all have something like that, right? I want us to look at what Apostle Paul says we need to do in verses 5 to 9. I'm just going to read this for you. He says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Now, when you look at this list, they are all corruptions of something good. And when you think about that one thing that you maybe, I don't know, maybe you thought about it, that one thing you know, if you lost it, you might, you might not want to live anymore. It's a good thing, right? Probably. I'm guessing like it's, it's something positive, not an evil thing. But these are all corruptions of something good. Sex is good. God made sex to be good. Passion is good. Desire is good. Anger even is good when it's used constructively. Our words are made to be good. That is how God created all these things. They're made to be good. And some of the others on the list aren't as obvious, but if you really go to the root of it, they are all, at the end, twisting of something good. Right? Satan is not a creator. Satan cannot create anything. He only takes what God has made and he twists them. So all of these things are, at their root, good things. Even the thing that you say, if I lost it, I would not want to live anymore. That is a good thing, probably. But the reason we, we see this corruption the reason that we, we get messed up by these good things is that we over-desire. You see this? When we over-desire something that is good, that is when the problem starts. So, if someone hurts my wife, I get angry. That is okay. That is good. A loved one is hurt. I should be angry. That is not right. But, if I over-desire, then I may want revenge. Right? I, don't, I don't just want justice, I want to hurt that person. Right? I, I may even want to kill that person if I'm passionate enough in my anger that is over-desire. I don't get the jobs I want. It's okay to feel sad. Let's say you really want this job, you don't get it. It's okay, you, you lost it, 
It's normal to feel sad. That's a loss, right? You should grieve your losses. It's appropriate to feel sad when you lose something of value. If you over-desire, you are crushed. You are depressed. You are in despair. You can't function, right? That's there's something wrong there. Losing something and feeling sad is right. Losing something and feeling you cannot function in your world. There's something wrong. There's an over-desire there. If I find out I don't have any money left, I should be concerned. Right? Money, I need money to buy food, I need money to, to pay for my house. It is a concern. It is a legitimate concern. You should be worried if you don't have money left. If I over-desire, I have panic. I'm panicking. I'm, the world is crumbling around me. I feel hopeless. Right? What am I going to do with my life? Right? That is over-desire. So scripture isn't talking about normal or healthy or appropriate emotions when it's talking about losing peace. We have to make this distinction here. It is not talking about getting angry when, a, when injustice happens. That is a proper response to injustice. It is talking about wanting so much more to an extent where it becomes evil and over-desire. So again, Jesus, he experienced the full range of emotions. But he did not over-desire. And therefore, he was the Prince of Peace. You see, that is a very important distinction to make. So how do we put to death these over-desires, these, these symptoms of our idols? Well, first, we need to identify. We need to identify what it is that we are idolizing, what it is that we are over-desiring. So when you lose your peace, next time you lose your peace, and you recognize that your reaction is not normal, right? Uh, and the, the way you maybe figure this out is, maybe you experience an extreme emotion to something that happened that you know other people wouldn't react that way to. Maybe it's something you know that you are so like riled up about, but it's not the same for others. Now, I'm not saying it's always the case, but that is sometimes a good indication, maybe. Why am I so upset about this, so sad about this, when other people don't seem to be? That can be one indication, not always, but one indication. And when you can look at that and, and begin to identify, uh, you need to ask uh, this one question. I'm sorry, the question you're not supposed to ask is this. We shouldn't be asking, why did this happen? How can I change my circumstances? That is not the question we need to be asking. The question we need to ask is, what good thing in my life has become my everything? What good thing? What is it family? Is it money? Is it education? Is it my looks? Is it, uh, I don't know, status, reputation? What good thing that God has given me have I made my everything? So we're not asking, God, why me? Or God, change this. Uh, if we want to get true peace, we have to begin asking, why am I over-desiring this thing? Is it something that has become my everything? What good thing that God has given me has become the ultimate reason for living in my life? And once you identify, then you can replace. And you replace by looking up. And that is what scripture tells us. I'll read verses 1 through 4. It says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Notice that the change that the Apostle Paul talks about doesn't start with what you do. It is not a change uh, in your circumstances in the sense where you, you get more wealth or more health or whatever, maybe more glory. It's not that. It says the Apostle Paul Apostle Paul begins with, if you have been raised 
with Christ. You see that? He starts with what Jesus has done for you. This is the beginning of peace. You don't start with something you do. It is not something you accumulate. It is not something you, a technique that you apply. It starts with what Jesus did for you. He starts with your new identity in Christ. Right? If you have been raised with Christ, right? you are a new person. If that is who you are, then this is possible. That right? is what he's saying here. He says, you died. You have died. And now the life you are living is your second life. You've been given a second chance. And your life is hidden with Christ. So what does this mean? It means that when the Father looks at you, what He sees is not your imperfection. What He sees is not your flaws. When the Father looks at you, He sees the perfection and righteousness of His Son, Jesus. Because you are hidden in Him. So how should that make us feel when the most important person in the universe sees that in us? When the most important person in the universe accepts us, loves us, cherishes us, is pleased with us in that way. It should give us great comfort and peace. Now Jesus died on the, same, on the cross to forgive our sins and to restore our relationship with our Father. And I remember, I mentioned Adam and Eve, what was it that happened when they sinned? They lost that relationship with the Father. So Jesus, when He died to forgive our sins, He restored that. He made that right again. But what is it that He did not do? He did not die primarily to change our circumstances. And I've made this point before. If Jesus' main mission was to change our outward circumstances, He would never have left Caesar on the throne in Rome. Because that was, for many Jewish people, the greatest pain and suffering that they could imagine. They were humiliated by being under the empire of Rome. And for Jesus to accomplish his mission and to leave Rome alone, that should tell us something. What is it that Jesus really wanted to accomplish for us? What was it that God believed was most important for his people? And yes, God's power can change and can, uh, can uh, transform our circumstances. God does it all the time. But I want you to see, God's peace was paid for by the death of a person to restore your relationship with the person so that that person would again rule in your hearts. Do you see this? This is a key to true peace. Allowing that person to come into your hearts, to fill that emptiness in your hearts, to be the ruler in your hearts, to reign and, and dominate your life situation, to become the filter through which you see everything else, your situation and other people. That is what brings us true peace. And my prayer to you all is that today you would continue to surrender control. I know that we, we want to gain more control, and we think control, more control, is the way to peace. But today, my prayer for you all is, let's learn the way the kingdom works. Let go of control. You can rest. You can relax. He is a king of kings. He is trustworthy. And he's leading us in the right way. Let's pray together.